So it creates a scenario where China is dependent on import of energy products. Now, one of the outcome of this is number one, the imported oil products or energy products for that to keep the price low for the Chinese entities. Because as I mentioned, the wage rate in China might be increasing more as compared to other countries. To compensate for that lack of advantage, what we observe, the Chinese government is a major provider of fossil fuel subsidies, which we can see from one of the panel, be it oil, electricity, the subsidy is quite high. And if we look at CO2 emission, because if there is over reliance on fossil fuel for energy generation or in the production process, that obvious outcome is the CO2 emission. Uh, all of you are aware of the Paris climate deal negotiation and the discussions, and India and China, the advanced developing countries, the way European Union mentioned them, are bound to have certain commitment of reduction of their emissions. So for China, the challenge then would be in the next coming days, how to have pollution abatement technologies by which they can retain their growth engine, but the per unit production cost of the Chinese manufacturing firms that do not get compromised to a very large extent. So this is going to be one major challenge for China in the coming days. And when I mentioned that rising budget deficit of the Chinese government, this is one of the other areas where there will be a major problem. Uh, foreign exchange reserve of China. Well, ideally I should have mentioned foreign exchange reserve as an advantage. But the way the Chinese government is uh, <coughs> operating with the forex reserve for let's say stabilizing U1 up to uh, this point. Currently, of course, China is slowly moving towards the market determination of the U1. Then uh, there is a practical challenge. As I mentioned, the Chinese GDP trade surplus X minus N had been the major driver. Now, if you just think back about the macroeconomics, if China is exporting more, then what does it mean? The demand for Chinese goods by the other people are increasing, which in effect means there is outflow of Chinese product. Demand for that dollar inflow in Chinese economy logically had you won in a flexible exchange rate, it would have appreciated because there is inflow of foreign currency. Now, what China did up to for a very long time is that they maintained a picked rate against the dollar, which they devalued at some point of times. In 2015, for instance, there was a huge devaluation. But to ensure that Chinese export can thrive, China followed a very long policy. The People's Bank of China, what they were doing, they were buying treasury bonds in the US market. Essentially, by that, what they were doing, they were selling yuans, they were allowing the domestic banks to have certain money that were being generated in the market, uh, sorry, to put it this way. When Chinese government was buying US treasury bonds, its asset, technically it's an increase in money supply. If there is rise in money supply, there would be inflation. So that inflation doesn't happen, China was now selling bonds to the current domestic banks at higher rate of interest, which ensured that it's mopping up the additional liquidity. So in effect, what was being done, the Chinese government was incurring losses as interest subsidy, but in effect, they were subsidizing the export industry from China. If exchange rate remains stabilized at the peg rate, at the undervalued value, then reaching the US market would be relatively easier. So in long term, China cannot continue with this particular strategy and there had to be a change in that. So very many uh, European and US 
industry organization lobbies you will find many reports of that order which clearly say once china make yuan a market determined rate that is if china export more dollar inflow or euro inflow happens and yuan automatically appreciate then china will not be having such a huge trade balance trade surplus against any of the countries we will get to see that in the coming days whether by moving towards more market determined yuan in coming days which china has to do at one point of time that change china's trade dynamics in a very large extent another way in which china converted the foreign exchange reserve in a strategic asset and enabled the growth to continue was creation of sovereign wealth funds now uh, the idea of the sovereign wealth fund is the following the foreign exchange reserve the chinese government is creating a separate fund through which if any state owned enterprises or private firms they would like to purchase let's say an oil block in sudan kazakhstan or they would like to acquire any other strategic asset in another part of the world but by raising money through equity finance from the market or from their past savings they are falling short of a few million dollars let's say 10 million then chinese government can substantiate their effort by bridging that particular gap now by this policy if you look at in very many parts of the world in africa in latin america several chinese firms several state owned enterprises has been able to capture purchase oil blocks or other strategic assets over the period which led to another challenge for the chinese in us in european union lot many resentment came also in latin america and africa as well that a state owned enterprise you never know what are the terms and conditions the chinese government is imposing on their operation and one of the complaints that us players made is that the chinese so is essentially they are importing iron ore or oil acquired from a foreign country bringing it cheap in the domestic market now i mentioned about the oil demand or energy demand so it's in effect subsidizing that which if you look at the wto principle is actionable a country has an upper limit up to which it can subsidize which is 5% at one rate of the final price so in 2008 imf under imf guidance the gap or the santiago principle came by which the sovereign wealth funds the countries were asked to have certain principle or discipline on how the sovereign wealth funds should operate ideally what is the purpose of a particular sovereign wealth fund why the government is lending money to a soe or a private sector has to be clearly spelled out there are many principles actually now if we look into the chinese operation china still don't share many details about its sovereign wealth fund operations so in coming days acquiring strategic assets through the swf operation is also going to be a difficult challenge for the chinese economy which they managed to do during 2006 7 8 period post 2008 the gap policies would have an implication now the domestic challenges then we understand fueling consumption would be one of the practical problem ensuring energy demand which through the sovereign wealth fund in short run china were effectively able to obtain uh creating more investment in the domestic market through administered rate of interest etc again in short run it paid but in long run now we look at the non performing assets or declining consumption so if you look at chinese growth then in y equal to c plus i plus g plus x minus n we come back to the x minus n c i and g all are having 
there are practical limitations in current PDA. They may definitely decouple, but perhaps it will take a sluggish path. So let's look at what could be the possible growth by China through the outward oriented policies. Let's cross it one by one. Uh, here are uh, some of the issues I broadly note. First, I will look at the presence of China in the world economy. Here I look at in the first panel, merchandise trade and second, services trade. In merchandise trade, if we look at, uh, it's actually all the manufacturing segments. The electrical components, 84, automobile, 87, Elect uh, computer electronics, HS85, iron and steel, HS72 and 73, everything that China is the market leader. So what we can see, there is a sharp rise in China's market share in the world trade up to 2015. Uh, 2016, if you can see, there is a downward kink. If you look into the surfaces trade share, there China's rise in market share is less dramatic. US still dominate that segment, so does Germany or UK. Uh, but there again also in 2015 there is a decline. The major service sectors that is fueling China's economic growth, tourism is one. The transportation service, the Chinese services are picking up because from China lot many exports are going to various parts of the country. So earlier dependence on other transport service providers is actually giving way. The domestic service providers are also coming up. These are some of the areas and other business services, professional services, again China is slowly taking up the world center state. But these are advantages actually. The challenge part comes from here. The over exposure to external shocks. In this particular slide I am looking at the year on year growth rate of export of merchandise products by world, India and China. Uh, you can look at 2008-9 which is the US subprime crisis recession year, 1415 the Greek and European crisis period also is quite visible. What we see is that the decline in export growth rate for the Chinese is happening quite frequently now because the moment there is a decline in the world growth, there is a decline for the Chinese economy as well. In fact, 2014-15, 2015-16, two years running, the export growth for China had been in negative. Uh, just one word of caution, it doesn't mean that Chinese export is not increasing because here we are looking at <coughs> value terms, not volume terms. And during this period, remember, we also witnessed price crash of several commodities. So even if countries are exporting more number of units, the total number of money realization has been lower. So from that perspective, even if China might be exporting relatively more in volume terms, in value terms, the export consignment are relatively lesser. And if you look into surface export growth rate, again, the same scenario can be witnessed. China is again witnessing a decline there as well. So the last component of GDP growth which sustained China even longer, there are certain uh, areas of or problem areas, let's say, we can observe. So if we try to go further down in the export segment, what are the problems? Why in China we are now witnessing this concern? I will look at two things and through that let's explain why China witnessed a long period of growth and now there is a slackening of the growth rate in export sector. Here what we observe in this particular slide is the flying this phenomena which I am sure many of you have read earlier. Essentially what by the flying this phenomena we look at is that on the vertical axis we look at indicator of comparative advantage of countries and sectors 
and you can look at technological sophistication or time on the horizontal axis because there is a one-to-one -one correspondence between them. Now, what the story says from the upper planet is that during 1950s and early 60s, Japan experienced rising comparative advantage. They snatched the market in manufacturing product from US for very many products, but Japan is a small island. So, labor price started increasing. That shows the decline in comparative advantage after a point. So, Japan started investing heavily in the new industrial economies of Asia, which means Hong Kong, Singapore, Taiwan, and South Korea. 70s and early 80s, we see growth of these economies. Early 80s and mid 90s, we see the ASEAN five economies, that is Indonesia, Malaysia, Thailand, Philippines. So they are getting the investment from not only Japan, but this time from Singapore and South Korea as well. China, the liberalization is coming actually from 90 onwards, because post Tiananmen Square, when China is facing the problem of the Sina function, they reformed once again. And which ensured that all Western economies and other potential investors were willing to invest in China. So no major action was taken. It only delayed their entry in WTO fold for some more years in terms of long negotiation period. So if we look at the growth of China, it actually benefited from the flying is phenomena over the period. But if you look at the more recent period, Vietnam as a country having very low labor price, so Cambodia and Laos, and India even, where there is a production base, the investments are coming. And if you look at the bottom panel, it just shows usually in countries investment went originally in the sector where uh, skill requirement was relatively moderate. So textile, it was not that complex. And after a lag of five, six years, when actually investments uh, started going to automobile segment, by that time, a substantial skilled labor set had been prepared. Now, after China benefited from this particular model of flying is, this I am borrowing from a OECD uh, report, it just shows how in China, when we talk about iPhone, for instance, I see a couple of iPads in the classroom. Now, is iPad a product of Apple, an American product? Technically, it is not. But we see, in China, a lot of validation is happening, and so is happening in other parts of the world. Idea is, in China, labor cost and several other factors work in its favor. But the way China benefited from the flying is model in the earlier period, if labor costs start rising, what will be the practical problems? The Hukou registration, for instance, labor supply in China is that completely free. So that is one of the ways in which we can look at. And if we take it further and try to look at what will happen to China in long run, I will again go back to another economic theoretical perspective, what we call the smile curve. The spine curve, again, is a old phenomena. As you can see, there is a dotted line, the 70s smile curve and the present day smile curve. What it means is that, suppose a country enters the production network in the world, say textile or automobile sectors where the uh, flying is model were working. In the initial period, suppose today, I'll just take a hypothetical example. If, suppose, China is having a contribution of, say, suppose the price of iPhone is $100, as an example, of course, and China's contribution to Apple for production of the iPhone is $10. Before any formal or conscious attempt by Apple is started, to integrate China in its value chain. Now, that is the first phase of the smile curve. Suppose now, Apple take note of China, and they realize in China, there is a huge labor supply. There is 
let's say mid skill to high skill workers there so they should enter that market in all probability what might happen the price of apple iphone because now they are getting quality part and component from china should come down to 90 dollar in fact that happens for all technology product the real i shouldn't talk about the real price the absolute price declines now ideally speaking then the contribution of chinese players should have been 9 dollar if we have a equal proportionate share that 100 dollar 10 dollar 90 dollar 9 dollar in all probability the downward slope of the smile curve explain that china's share might be 7 dollar for some time why? It might happen given to three reasons. One, let's say the Chinese players earlier were producing some chip for the mobile phone only for the domestic market and let's say in Southeast Asian market. Now they have a bigger market. So the scale of their operation is going to increase and again in economic sense we always look at the fixed cost curve or the average fixed cost curve. That will have a falling segment over the period. So it will mean in long term the average cost of the players are coming down. They can supply their product at a cheaper rate. And whom the Chinese are displacing? They will be displacing the Thai people, Thai producers. So effectively you are not selling your product at 6 rupees 61 making 1 1 profit but 5.5 Entering the market is more important for you to be part of the network with Apple and other players. So the competition would drive price further down. And the third point by which the price may actually fall in China or share might fall in China is the technology transfer. We might find that Apple would share the technology. Uh, it happens. Uh, I'm sure some of you read about the legal battle between Apple and Samsung a couple of years back. They gave the contract outsourcing to Samsung. Samsung delivered the product and happily used some part of the technology in their Samsung Pro notebook. So here, if technology transfer is happening, then actually you can produce your chips and other parts and components at a cheaper price. So in every country what you might find, the initial phase of production network, your contribution might decline. But then comes a turnaround point. It will happen only if Apple or any other uh, multinational for that matter, they entrust you with more value addition in your territory. So you are just not doing the contract manufacturing, you are having the research and development <coughs> center, you are going for the marketing, distribution, after sales service, essentially the value addition part more effectively. Then Apple price may come down to $80, but China now instead of $8, they are going to contribute for about $21 or $22 in the total value chain of Apple iPhones. So if you look into the current scenario, I will look at one or two products from OECD Tifa trading value added database. Uh, we look at base metal and fabricated metal products. What we see, if we compare 95 to 2000 and 2008, it shows the classic smile curve, right? But if you look from 2008-9 onwards, the curve doesn't look like a U-shaped curve anymore. It looks like a slanting S curve. If you look into transport equipment, there again, for the last 2-3 years, what we see, it's actually showing up slow down. Now, I'll just go back for a minute. Uh, in Indian context also, I'm sure you keep noting that some of the time the industry demand, there should be some form of government control or increased tariff. Essentially, it happens when countries at the point of turnaround, when your share is actually declining, there is a possibility of trade deficit. Because you are exporting more, but value terms you are actually earning this. When countries start imposing tariff at the bottom point of the smile curve, actually then a country slips, which happened for Indonesia and many other countries. Countries who can actually go ahead on the path of liberalization, they are realizing the growth after a point. 
coming back to China. So what is the implication? I mentioned earlier, X minus M is going to drive GDP. But if, let's say, the share of China is declining, or if this is the domestic valuation in China's total export is declining, what does that mean? It means that the Chinese firms are actually now willingly uh, outsourcing some part of their production operation in Southeast Asian countries, which is actually happening. So in long run, the question is, will this cause a challenge for China, for Chinese exports? In short run, it doesn't look like a challenge because we are still having a managed yuan. If yuan becomes completely market leader, then what is going to happen? Perhaps this is going to be a bigger challenge for China in that point of time. Because it is clear that wage rate in China is increasing despite the time lag with productivity rise. So, initial advantage China had is being depleted. That takes me to the next step, which again facilitated China to maintain its export dominance for a long period of time. Let me uh, just give a dot background and then come back to the slide in uh, exact details. In this slide, I am looking at the countries with whom China is currently having a free trade agreement or a preferential trade agreement. It includes the proposed and potentials as well, which uh, is why India is also there. Because with India now, I said, the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership China is currently negotiating. You definitely would remember, China became a member of WTO from 2001 onwards, after a very long negotiation with all WTO member countries. And US was not that interested to let China enter. They were very interested to invest in China, because labor cost in China was much lower than the corresponding American labor cost. What they realized, once China is able to export to American or other markets, it would cause a major problem. So, they had a compromise, and China agreed to that. The compromise was, China would be allowed to enter, but US and other WTO members would consider China as a non-market economy for 15 years, up to 2016. What is the implication of non-market economy? If, let's say, China is dumping a product, if, suppose, America is conducting an investigation against India, then American authorities are supposed to acknowledge the price, the data, essentially the Indian firms are providing. Because American authorities have to compare. What's the price in India? I'll just give a practical example why American authorities should be demanding the price actually. How can you compare dumping? Let's say China is exporting to Australia and India. You can compare what's the price China is exporting to <coughs> Australia in India. If it's substantially lower, that's a case of dumping. But if China is suppose only selling the product in domestic market and exporting to India, then we are going to compare what's the domestic price and in India. But uh, if you remember, Professor Parte gave an example in morning about the Rakhis, about the Diyas in Diwabali. There are many products that are produced in China specifically for the Indian market. Then you can't compare with Australia. You are not comparing with Chinese domestic price. Then what you have to do is to look what is the factory grade price of that product, add a 5% normal profit given the industry norm, and then compare with the export price. Now, for that, it is very important if products are of that sort, Many times, Indian entities, for instance, export to US, which are specifically for the US market. In that production run, they are not selling in India. They are supposed to believe the price that India is quoting, because India is a market economy. Rate of interest, RBI, well, they set the basis points, etc. But it's largely market determined. We all know that Mr. Jaitley wanted the rate of interest to lower, but Dr. Rajan protested. So that neutrality is very much there. If you look into China, power supply, power tariff, 
market determined, rate of interest, market determined, U1, market determined, sorry, uh, determined by the government, administered. So essentially what happens? US said, we are not going to take any price as market determined. We are going to conduct an investigation and if we believe that it's not market determined, then we are going to use something called surrogate country method. Say, for a particular production, the factory had been run for 14 hours in that shift. That hour component will be there, but electricity rate, a country can compare, use that of Singapore. 20 workers have worked, 20 number will be there, wage rate, they may take that of Indonesia as a hypothetical example. That's the purpose of the surrogate country method. Now, coming back to this particular slide, what China did? They used the RTS strategy extremely effectively. From 2001, China joined. They realized a number of anti-dumping investigations are being imposed by US, European Union, and India as well. And they are invoking the non-market economic provision. That China is a non-market economy. So whatever price a domestic Chinese firm is claiming, it's not right. And as you can understand, in the surrogate country method, there is a backward error. Countries would always try to set the actual price at a much higher level so that they can prove dumping. So China followed the RTS strategy. With a number of countries, they entered into regional trade agreement and they said, have 0% tariff from tomorrow. Your product can enter the Chinese market, but write on a piece of paper that China is a market economy. And it worked prevent the spin channels favor. Uh, ASEAN, when they entered with China as a regional trade agreement, acknowledged China as a market economy, and from 2019 onwards, you will find Indonesian, Malaysian newspapers are carrying articles where industry is crying. We should go back to the pre-RTA days where we can consider China non-market economy and we can impose the anti-dumping duty once again. So from 2016 after that, 2017 onwards, it started and we are in 2018 now. China is no longer a non-market economy. So we have to trust their price, though we know power is still government determined. Yuan is not fully market determined. Rate of interest is again having a government backing. China's response to WTO, they are reforming gradually and would reform shortly. So, coming back to Indian context, uh, all of you definitely keep reading in Hindu business line or other newspapers that RCEP negotiation is going on and India is not yet giving the final consent and signature. This perhaps is one of the reasons where the government feels now we cannot go for the non-market economic provision. So once RCEP as a block is there, the Chinese export to flood the Indian market. So this is the asset political economy, we can say. The second point. Now, President Trump decided to pull out from TPP. What is the implication for, of that for RCEP, India, or other countries? We know there is a commonality among the members of RCEP and TPP in Southeast Asia. A number of countries, they belong to both groups. Now, those ASEAN countries, they were already having a huge trade deficit with respect to China. And like India, they were also moving cautiously on RCEP negotiation. One of the logic or idea for them was, if TPP comes, US, we all accept, is relatively more open as compared to China, as far as trade policies are concerned. But standard, if you look at US FDA, in all probability would have a higher standard, but not tariff or other barriers. Now here, after US pull out, what's the option for the Southeast Asian countries? Actually, we see throughout 2017, the Southeast Asian countries increased pressure on India that now TPP is no longer there as a viable option. And frankly, if US is out, without US, TPP can it be a mega regional anymore, though Japan and other countries are there. They are not. US was making it a mega regional. So that way, the US exit is intensifying the pressure on India and 
we will get to see in 2018 itself or perhaps in 2019 whether we sign that and whether in our terms or in China's terms. Because it's clear now, China in RCEP is the central power. So, when I mentioned China is having export surplus with all the countries, what is China's export composition? I'm just borrowing data from weeds here and looking at broad classification of exports. What we see, China's export of intermediate goods is coming down. It's rising in the value chain, exporting more of the capital goods. Even consumer goods in value terms is relatively lesser now. If you just have a comparison with India, we are actually still in the intermediate goods and consumer goods phase. If you look at imports, now remember I mentioned China is more dependent on Africa, Latin America and other Asian countries for import of raw material because the resource security is actually a major problem or import of crude petroleum oil for that matter. So raw material import by China if you look at that's rising sharp. Capital good import or consumer good import they are remaining at a moderate level. It's actually the import of intermediate goods which is declining at the cost of the by displaced by the raw materials. India on the other hand what we see we still import a lot of intermediate goods as well as capital goods. And uh, if we look at the trade balance scenario of China, with world it's having a huge surplus, with Japan some form of trade deficit exists. India, it enjoyed a trade deficit during 2001 to 5 period, but from 2006 onwards the trade surplus is increasing exponentially and so is with US. So no wonder countries are not very comfortable with China maintaining the administered E1 or other policies. So, I will uh, look at the last part of the discussion, the trade balance that China is enjoying, whether China is indeed using fair measures to obtain this particular trade balance. There are actually lot many allegations against China which are coming and that's where my, uh, the topic of my discussion comes, the challenge part. How is China going to address these issues? Let's uh, look at them one by one. Number one, uh, anti-dumping. Anti-dumping, by definition, what we look at? We look at uh, two series here. One, anti-dumping initiation, that is a country investigated a case against China, they may not have imposed a final duty. That's the reason why the blue lines are below the brown lines for most of the years. A country may investigate, but at the end of the day, find either China is not dumping, or the dumping margin is not very significant, or it is not hurting the domestic industry that much. So here what you see is that, if you look at seasonality, whenever there is recession, the anti-dumping cases rise. 2009, a sharp rise, 2016, 2015-16 a sharp rise. Countries in normal year may find it good that China is dumping. So their consumers are getting products cheap. But a year when there is recession, their domestic players are facing the heat of competition, they would be more nationalistic. So anti-dumping investigation rise. There is a seasonality of domestic growth or global growth to that. Uh, what is the challenge for China now? It's a market economy, still number of investigations are not declining because of the pending reform in domestic economy. You want rate of interest, power tariff and many other fronts. So the unfinished reform China must complete in the coming days. Otherwise, the export surplus that it is enjoying, countries would try to nullify that by anti-dumping investigation and there is a second variable I will look at, which is the countervailing duty. What is countervailing duty? If countries can prove that China is giving subsidy, giving subsidy in excess of 5% at following of the final product price, then they will impose a tariff or countervailing duty, which is just countervailing. Let's say uh, price of a Chinese product should have been 21, but China is selling that 
Act 81 because Chinese government is giving power subsidy or giving certain tax break, which is an income burden, then the two per uh, yuan tariff any importer can officially impose. Here again, what we see the initiation and measures against the Chinese, it's having the seasonality. 2009, a recession year, initiation peak against the Chinese. 13, the big tragedy. Again, there is a peak. And 2016, there is again a peak. So, it's like the countries are taking note of China as a violator of the respective WTO provisions. Normal years, they take the benefit of the Chinese subsidy, but whenever abnormal year comes, they retaliate by entering into the investigation against the Chinese exports. And uh, I'll just uh, have one rough example of government set or government guided prices in China. It happened at various levels, the central government, local government. It's by the way not exhaustive at all. I'm just putting three or four type of subsidies that exist in the Chinese market now. There are more than 200 means in which the prices in China continue to be government guided, motivated or set. So this takes me to the one of the major area whether China can propel the growth engine through foreign investment. I already mentioned about the sovereign wealth fund, which is in a way the Chinese government is complementing the outward investment of the foreign players. Uh, let's separate. On the first panel, the left hand side, I am looking at the FDI inflows in China as a percentage of GDP. Now if you look at 81 to 90, it was relatively low. It's the early day era. So obviously at that point of time, the infrastructure and other things in China was not yet at its peak. 91, 2000, it actually peaks. Because if you remember the smile curve, it's exactly at that point, China enters the global production networks. But if you look at 2001, 10 and 11, 16, the FDI is declining as a percentage of GDP. Well, one thing is, of course, they are the Chinese GDP is also increasing at a very first rate, but FDI is preventing. It's not that FDI is declining in absolute terms. Why the decline so much? One factor, we again have to acknowledge that labor cost in China is not as cheap as it was during 90s. So newer investment are going to Vietnam, Laos, Cambodia, countries where in Southeast Asia, there are cheap labor and by Asia Development Bank investment, the Greater Mekong subregion, for instance, would be a good example, or the East-West Corridor, there had been good infrastructure created. So there can be exports from these markets or basic activity in these markets to Singapore, which is an ASEAN market, and from there, final export can occur. Chinese FDI outflow them as a percentage of GDP which is a rising number. Actually, what we argue is that FDI outflow is now a growth compulsion for the Chinese. Because the FDI outflow is going for extractive industries, alternative energy. So when we talked about the energy security for China, food security for China, or other compulsions, the FDI from China is actually ensuring that of the growth engine. I'll just give one practical example, which I drew from a 2017 report. Let's look at Latin America, the Chinese investment. It's going heavily in mining and quarrying, lead, copper, iron, etc. Now, what we observe is that most of the time, the investment from China in these markets are going either through SOEs or through SWFs. Again, remember the non-transparency provision that we talked about. So many a time the countries argue that the Chinese government is bringing the ores and supplying it for the domestic players at a concessional price. Unfortunately, if the terms of the contract are not known, which China is not yet sharing clearly, the countries can actually go for the counterfeiting duties. And if you look at the concern for India, there are serious concerns actually. What we see in EU and US in metal segment, 
newer barriers are coming up in forms of quality standard, tariff, etc. And while they are trying to stop the Chinese imports from coming, in WTO terms, most favored national MFN is the binding clause. That is, you cannot discriminate among partner countries. They can't increase tariff against China. If you look at anti-dumping and counterfeiting duties, proving both are difficult some of the time. Tariff is a much easier tool from that perspective. So what we observe, the barrier against India in EU and US in metal segment is actually increasing thanks to the Chinese outward investment and of course the food and energy security of China is showing increased Chinese investment again through sovereign wealth fund in Africa, Latin America and several other countries. So outward investment is one of the Chinese response to the possible challenge to growth that we see and in a way we see that the FDI outflow would sustain the Chinese growth for a few more years. That's a very important step for the Chinese economy now. The last point I would look at would be, can China now have a round of technological progress? Remember when I mentioned that China entered the global production network from the 90s, which we could see from the FDI inflow, there was a significant degree of technology transfer that occurred in the country. Now, the Chinese farm during 90s, they were actually ready for the technology scale. Technology was at a moderate level. So if DI when it came, there was a sharp rise in productivity reflected in GDP. If today, to begin with, we have FDI flow declining, again another round of technology comes, can it really change China's productivity? It may not. There exists a number of studies by World Bank, ADB and IMF. What it says is that the Chinese farms are almost at the frontier now. They cannot grow with just normal technology coming. There has to be sharp change reforms in the economy in terms of labor reform that the food system uh, to be replaced. The industrial policy must be replaced. The overall focus on export should give way to domestic consumption and investment promotion, etc. To add to that, there is one additional factor. Are foreign firms, to a large extent, sending updated technology to China? What we see, of course, China has improved its technology and uh, IPR enforcement process to a large extent, but, <coughs> excuse me, During 2004-05 period onwards and for the next couple of years, in a number of cases China entered into a couple of industrial espionage cases. I'm just borrowing two newspaper reports and I'm sure you are aware of a lot more. Even today if we look at the number of disputes regarding copyright, patent and trademark, I'm borrowing it from the WTO Trade Policy Review on China which was published in 2015. 16, so it's giving the data in 2015, but in 2016 and 17, lot many instances of <clears throat> violation of the IPR were reported. So this is one major area of reform challenge for China to put their intellectual property right enforcement at par with the global standard. And in a sense, what we can say, China is already started to take note of that and lot many research incentive in the form of tax cuts. By the way, in India also we have the 200% tax benefit for the research and development, in-house research and development for new technology, etc. So China is following a similar line. Through that, they are trying to come out with a better technology frontier. And when we look at COMAC, the light commercial aircraft, for a very long time we had Boeing and Airbus maintaining a virtual duopoly in the world trade in the LCS. So if COMAC comes, it will actually set three players in the global setting. But my hunch is, uh, 
I have four minutes, but from there I will take two to just comment on Boeing and Airbus and I will come back on China. Boeing and Airbus, that is US and European Union, they lodged a case against each other and WTO dispute settlement body. Because rightly they could identify the others are giving subsidies. Now, what Airbus could establish was that whenever NASA is developing a rocket engine or sending a space shuttle to Mars, they are sharing the technology with Boeing, which is a huge research and development subsidy. European Space Research Centers, they are also doing the same to Airbus. And in effect, what they did was that WTO said, Boeing cannot receive government subsidy, Airbus cannot receive government subsidy. So, Boeing and Airbus stopped complaining against each other. And they started living with subsidies to each other. Better not to rock the boat. Once China enter, we are going to see a change in the equilibrium. I'm sure China is going to bring up the question of subsidies being provided by US and EU government to Boeing and Airbus. But at the same time, I'm sure the subsidy that COMAC received from Chinese government, EU and US are going to raise their fingers. So it will be one interesting great war, how the Chinese subsidies, whether they are actionable or not, WTO trade law perhaps would tell us in coming days. So let me stop at this point. Thank you very much.